Well, hi, Paul Pigat. Hello. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again, even though we're together but apart. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> On the infamous Zoom um, that we've all learned to live with in, this, in these strange times. Well, we're, we're back for our, our second part, and uh, we were having so much fun with the blindfold that we thought we should just continue on. <laughs> Right. If, if you're still if you're still game, I haven't scared you off from the first first episode. No, I got I I, I will I will I will uh, do my best to completely mess this up. Jimmy Bryant. Jimmy Bryant, the speed rest. That's Jimmy Bryant and Speedy West. And uh, who might the guitarists be? <laughs> who might the special what? guest guitarist on that track be? There's a special guest guitarist on that. It's not just Jimmy Bryant. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. It's it's a Jimmy Bryant tune. It's not him though. It's not him. Who would be? Uh, it's not Jimmy Rivers. No, it's not Jimmy Rivers. Who do you know who would cover that tune? Oh, is that Luca Benedetti? It's Luca Benedetti. And Scott Smith. <laughs> and Scott Smith. Am I on the? Am I on? I'm on that record. Am I on that track too? You're on that track. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we're so good. We sound like the original. You sound like the original. Especially coming <laughs> through a like, Zoom. I've never done that before. Made made somebody who I'm blindfolding in the blindfold. Uh, I was going to do it to Corey Weeds, but, and he thought, he thought, he, oh, who is that guy? He's, he's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I usually say too. I've forgotten, <laughs> I've forgotten about a lot of, a lot of sessions I've done and records I've done for people. And I go, who is this playing guitar? And then I, and then they say, it's you. Oh, <laughs> All right. It's great. So it, you thought it was the original artist. So that's really interesting that it's like you said, it's that it's it's that authentic. Um, so I, I wanted to play some Luca Benedetti because you and I both have a strong connection to Luca and the whole scene that he started here in Vancouver while he was here. Maybe just a little bit of background. Luca Benedetti, a great New York uh, City guitar player. Um, you guys are like separated twins at birth with your styles and 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 your and your scenes. It feels like uh, it was a natural affinity that you guys would would play together and and um, be a part of that Heatley scene that Lucas seemed to be pretty fundamental with starting. Yeah, he put the, he really got the ball rolling on that. There was, um, you know, we we sort of known about each other, of course, through the internet and through Facebook and things like that, and other mutual friends like Jason Loglin. And uh, yeah, it was just like a, it was a natural connection because we both, you know, were listening to the same music and playing the same kind of thing and, and uh, are complete guitar geeks. So, you know, guitar geeks need to stay together. It's very important. Yeah, you know, I loved all of the stuff he was doing. And so I'm hoping once this is all over, I'll get to New York and I've, I've um, you know, I want to see Jason. I want to see Luca and, and another good friend of mine, Alan, Adam Levy. Uh, has just moved back to New York and and um, and I'm trying to connect. Well, Luca and and, uh, and Jason are good friends, but I'm trying to hook them all up with Adam Levy as well, who's another fantastic guitar player. And uh, you know, we'll have a guitar summit in New York. Awesome. Maybe That's Ulrich involved. <laughs> well, he started this great Vancouver band, Speeding West, uh, based on like you know people like uh, Jimmy Bryant and and that. Mickey Baker is another influence. Um, and it had Scott Smith on pedal steel, Jeremy Holmes on bass, and Nino Di Pasquale on drums. And it was a fantastic band. They had a couple of recordings. Maybe talk about this particular guitar style. Well, this is, this is uh, you know, it's, it's, it's resurrecting what would have been, you know, the guitar heroes of, of the early 50s, right? Because um, you know, it's... Technically, this style of guitar playing is called takeoff guitar, 
I still don't know exactly why it's called takeoff guitar, other than generally when the guitar comes out of the gates, it blasts right into the stratosphere, which is you know, kind of the style. But it's it culminates around Jimmy Bryant, the hot shot of this style. A resurgence, you know, it goes it goes way, way, way back, you know, back to the 80s, I would say, you know, with, with the beginning of Big Sandy and the Fly Right Boys. And of course, you know, Ray Kondo and that whole Western swing rockabilly scene. It's very West Coast that, that these kind of musicians were beginning to be idolized. Um, but I look forward to when we can pack it in at the Heatley again, because <laughs> yeah, those, those Luca Benedetti nights, which fought, which Scott Smith continued on with his pedal steel nights were just uh, once a month. And, you know, every, every musician in town, it felt felt like who, who was anybody would show up and Paul, you were very often the guest. So you're a big part of that too. to follow up with Jim, with Jim, obviously um, a, another guitarist in, in this style. And it was Luca that turned me on to Jim and we ended up bringing Jim out for a couple of concerts. You know, he's, he's really, although he doesn't do a lot of his trademarks in the clip, in the clip that you just played, he's, he's a very easy guitar player to spot right away. So how did you, if he wasn't doing his normal thing, how did you, how did you tell it was him? His touch is really light. I won't say it's classical, but he really likes these kind of minuetty kind of tunes. And there's a certain warble that he gets out of a guitar. Because, uh, you know, he plays a very, a very unique 1959 Telecaster. That's that. You know, there. Are, when you find an instrument like that and you become so attuned to it, right? You, there's things that you can pull out of it. And he's incredibly in tune with that guitar. And there's just a. a you know, by shaking the neck, you can hear him actually shake the neck and change the pitch of the notes. And that always, I can always tell when he's playing. Have you known of him for a long time? Yeah, I've known about him since about 2010. Because um, I, 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 I got into his, uh, I forget which record it was. It might have been Orange or it might have been one of the earlier ones than that. Um, and then I met him at the NAMM show in Los Angeles in 2010. Yeah. Very briefly, that was the year they. I believe that they made a, they made a very limited run signature model for him. Yeah, I he was there for that. Uh, I I was there with cousin Harley, and he was there to uh, to release his new guitar. Well, a beautiful guitar player and a really interesting guy. Really enjoyed meeting him and and, and having him out, and we'll have to get him back again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he's he's um, because he, it's funny. It's funny that I, I i got to know him because of his sort of new york combo um and then you know as i as i started to listen more and more and, and then i remember uh, then i found out about 10 gallon cat which was the band that he had in san francisco and one of my biggest influences is a, is a guitar player named jimmy rivers and of course jim knew jimmy rivers and oh he did and did, did they play together there is a very a very short clip of them playing a little bit on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Jimmy Rivers and Vance Terry, uh, their record Brisbane Bop was probably the most important guitar record I've ever owned. Oh my God, I, got, I have to write that down and, and play it. Uh, he also played uh, a, another very unique guitar. He had a, a hollow body Gibson double neck, which is an extraordinarily rare guitar. Um, and the steel player, Vance Terry, which I think I've told you the story about Vance, very, very sad story. 
uh, he didn't end well, but but at that time, he was, and I still I still think he's probably one of the best pedal steel players to have ever walked the earth. You know, when you hear him play, it's like listening to the whole Ellington Orchestra coming out of one instrument. Incredible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just I'm just. Uh... I'm just thinking about your last names. You're all Italian heritage, all you guitarists. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of the, the guitar and the Italians go together quite well. There's, there's a lot of them, right? You know, maybe not many people know that about you, Paul. That you act that you have uh, Pagat doesn't sound Italian, but it is Italian. Yes, it is. Yes, it's northern, northern Italian. There's been there's you know for some reason yeah there's there's a lot of Italian guitar players like you know the Pizzarellis of course. Jimmy Bruno, who's another fantastic jazz guitar player from New York City. Joe, Joe Pass. Joe Pass, another another uh, fellow paisan. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's lots of us. Luca, Jim, obviously, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so you all you all seem to find each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a it's a secret club we have. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, track number three. I'm ready. I'm, I'm impressed that you got that one. <laughs> Big lazy. Big lazy. Oh. It's too easy for you. I just want to play a couple of because it's so groovy and fun. I love this. I love that. This is my favorite record. Player. Really? Not the new one. So, yes, Big Lazy. I wasn't going to pick a tune from the new album. I thought that's too easy because you've just. We have to change Stephen's last name to. We need to put a vowel on the end of it so he can be part oh. of the Italian club. <laughs> So Steve, Stephen Ulrich, another wonderful New York guitarist that you turned me on to, to Stephen. I found out about him. Um, I was just, you know, I was going down the rabbit hole on YouTube one night and I found a song uh, by by Big Lazy called uh, Princess Nicotine that I had, you know, I'd never heard Big Lazy before. And I listened to this song and I said, this is the music I hear in my head. This is what, you know, when I when I'm sitting down writing stuff, I go, this is the kind of stuff that I would write. The guitar playing is fantastic. The tone is incredible. So then I went down the the, the big lady and uh, and decided that I had to get to know Stephen Ulrich. So um, so I text or I I Facebooked him for about six months, and he didn't return any of my Facebooks. No. Who's this a, crazy Vancouver guy? Yeah, I got him a gig. The best part is I got him a gig. He didn't he's, know me. And he still, he still wouldn't talk to you. Oh, he talked to me after I got him the gig. Oh. <laughs> I don't think he know he knows I got him the gig. Um, I was supposed to do a Gretsch event in, uh, in Brooklyn, and I couldn't make it that year. And um, I suggested right away, I said, there's this, this guy, his, his band's Big Lazy. He's in the area. So hire them, and then he did. He did the show, and then and he did really well. And then and then he got in touch with me, and ever and ever since he got in touch with me, we've been, we've been, you know, emailing or talking on the phone back and forth all the time. And I, you know, I'll send him emails. You know, we've known each other for I guess about four years now, and I'll send him emails or, or texts from the strangest places, like you know, hey man, I'm in, I'm in, you know, I'm in China or something, and I'm listening to one of the big lazy songs while i'm walking around <laughs> the next time i'll email him is like hey man i'm in germany <laughs> this is back when i used to actually have a touring career um and i thought it, it seems that it, it gave him a big kick because um you know when i when i first got into the band i i, I noticed i watched their discography and there was a very large gap and i know that the steven's a dad so i, I figured he took some time off um you know just to be a dad uh, so he wasn't touring for a while. So, you know, I, I would sort of hopefully get him to live vicariously through me going, Hey man, even though you're not out here playing your music right now, I'm out here listening to it in all these crazy places. And, and now he's working more than I am because there, he's working all over New York during, uh, there's, there's been a bunch of shows that he's been doing. And he's doing a lot of film. He's, he was doing a lot of film work too. So he was on uh, a TV show, I believe. The tune was the low way from don't cross Myrtle. Mm -hmm. 
for his 2014 album uh, features Andrew Hall on acoustic bass and Yuval Lyon on drums. That rhythm section, I, I think, is one of the best rhythm sections I've ever heard. You know, uh, the big lazy rhythm section is just, it's the perfect platform for Stephen to play over top of. Oh, well, high praise coming from you, Paul. And uh, know that we, you know, we, we meant to have them come out for the 2020 Jazz Festival, the North Shore Jazz Series. And, um, but we'll try again for 2021. Okay. We're at the last blindfold. Yay. You're, you're just. It's going to be hard. I know it's going to be hard. You're, you're rocking it, though. All right. As I knew you would. <laughs> point did you know it was kevin bright <laughs> well first the grindy tone because that's something he's sort of he's sort of really uh has always embraced but it's a more fuzz oriented tone now but one, once you hear the first slide once once you hear him slide on a string you know exactly who it is that's that's the signature okay <laughs> only he plays slide guitar like that there's lots of great slide guitar players out there but he is the most He's the most humanistic slide guitar player I've ever heard. Humanistic. That's an interesting uh, description. Word, it's it's like the it's it's just completely like the voice. When I hear him play, it's like it's like you know some people say that the cello is the most it's the most human of all the of all the of all the viol family because it's the most closest to the human voice. The way he plays slide is like the way someone speaks. Hmm. just the way he glides notes and the way we glide our words it's the same mm -hmm. i hear it exactly the same way kevin was a natural choice given your connection with kevin and i understand you've been recording together during COVID. so tell me about that experience yeah that was that was a really uh, that was a pleasant surprise we just kept bouncing tracks back and forth and and yeah it turned out to be a record it's it's a weird record you know it's 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 sort of uh it's it's hillbilly it, it, the only way i can describe it is 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 it's hillbilly circus music <laughs> <laughs> well he's I, I i was listening to his latest record well that's that's where that that tune's from it's mother's cover from his 2019 album stella bella strada i love this description that i found of him musical visionary who exists in a land somewhere between derek trucks and frank zappa <laughs> Right, and I describe him as Jeff Beck meets Thelonious Monk. Oh, okay, yeah. Before I got to know Kevin, whenever I flew to Toronto to see my family, I would always fly in on a Sunday and leave on a Tuesday because every Monday he would play at the Orbit Room with the Sisters Euclid. And um, I'd go see at, at least two shows. I'd, I'd, you know, If I was going for a week, I'd at least get two shows out of it. And um, yeah, I just was completely mesmerized by this this crazy tall lanky guitar player that that could do things that when when i was watching his hands and i you know i'm no i, I kind of know my way around a guitar but when i'm watching him I, go, I don't understand how he's able to achieve the sounds that he's getting out of the instrument when i'm watching him do it I go, that shouldn't actually come out of the amplifier with what his hands are actually doing but he's he's magical he's magical well, this this new album is terrific. It's got a, a kind of New Orleans horn section, and uh, you never know what you're going to get. Like each track is pretty unique. Have you checked out Johnny Goldtooth and the Chevy Casanovas? Nope. His alter ego? Oh, you have to check out his alter ego. <laughs> Gold 
Goldtooth. So there is there is an actual little mockumentary that's online about Johnny Goldtooth, and it's the history of Johnny Goldtooth. What, what has been the secret of your long association with him? No. No. And uh, it's really incredibly funny. Uh, but the record, the record that he did to support this this alter ego is fantastic. Oh, super. Well, I always get these great tips from you, Paul. <laughs> All right. Well, we, you've cast the blindfold with flying colors, my friend. <laughs> Who would have guessed it? <laughs> well, we have uh, a nice project coming up together, uh, Paul Pagat, um, yes. with your very wonderful trio, your legendary trio, Cousin Harley. And we're going to do a CD release together, a virtual CD release. November 26th will be the watch party. We're going to send it out as a link to purchase, and you'll have the whole weekend to watch it. You're allowed to dance around your living room all you want. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, and because you're at home, clothing is optional. So that makes it even more <laughs> exciting. Uh, I just decided it was time to do another record with Cousin Harley. It's, it's our seventh record. Wow. That's fantastic. A lot of records. You know, our last record, which was a tribute to Mr. Merle Travis. So it was a very tame record. When I won't say a tame record. It was still very rambunctious and typically Cousin Harley. But Cousin Harley has always been, had a very punky side to it when we wanted it to be punky. Uh, and you know, what's, what's your famous quote from the Delirious Dutch band? The Motorhead of Rockabilly. So yes. <laughs> the Motorhead of Rockabilly. <laughs> I wanted to embrace said Motorhead of Rockabilly again. So uh, this is a little bit more of a rock inside of a record. So I wrote all the tunes. Um, this is the first record we've ever done that I, there isn't one cover. Usually I do at least one or two covers on it. There are no covers on this record. I wrote everything on it. Um, I wanted it to. I wanted it to really focus on the parts of the parts of this. You know, I, I know people call us a rockabilly band, but we're not really a rockabilly band. We're we're a hillbilly rock and roll band. So. Uh, or, you know, we're a band. That's the better way to just say it. We're a band. Um, I like country music. I like hillbilly music. I like rockabilly music. I like blues music. I like Latin music. So, you know, this is this is everything from, you know, straight up um, honky kind of ideas to some, there's some great Latin ideas on the new record. There's some, there's some screaming rock and roll truck driving music. Um, yeah, I'm really happy with it. I'm really happy with the way it turned out. You know, with every record that I've ever done, there's at some point I decide I hate it. I hate every record I've done. And this always happens because you work on this record for so long and you're going, okay, it's finally done. And then you put it away and two weeks later you listen to it going, oh, I hate it all. Uh, and I, I've only had one day of that with this record. So that's good. Usually it lasts a lot longer. Oh, wow. I, I'm back to really loving this record. It really, it really does, it really sort of, uh, culminate a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the ideas we've done over the years. In fact, someone that I, a good friend of mine, Adam P. W. Smith, who does all my, most of my photography, I gave him an early, an early mix of it, and uh, and he said, Paul, this is like, this is like you've taken all seven records that you've done before and you've mixed them and just got the best elements out of all seven. Wow, oh, that's really high praise. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with it. It's 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 certainly a, a little bit more aggressive than than certainly the last one it's nothing like merle travis um and it's it's probably closer to our first record jukin than than any of our other records so you know coming for full circle you know i'm 51 now trying to relive my late 20s well, i can't wait to hear it live from our stage at the blue shore it's going to be fantastic well, I want to thank you for joining me on Zoom. Yeah. We, we enjoyed uh, our, our first interview on our stage, and um, but this is being fun, too, from my living room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, this is my room. This is where the magic happens. There's guitars. Yeah. There's a pile. Look at them all. pile of guitars over there. I know you're building guitars. Like, COVID's being kind to, to your guitar production. <laughs> I didn't build any of these. <laughs> these, these are all... These are all your babies. <laughs> These are the ones I, I make, you know, I make a living with. The, the ones I build are just for fun. Um, yeah, there's more. I don't, you know, there's, there's, that's, there's a screen there, they're behind there. Uh, yeah, there's a lot more. Anyway, it's a privilege to see into your, into your living room and into your world a little bit. And... My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, we're going to end with one of your songs, Paul. Um, what, what are we going to hear? 
Okay. Uh, the song I'm going to end with is uh, what I consider to be uh, the perfect murder ballad. This song is written by a good friend of mine from Vancouver Island named Tolan McNeil. We were all living in a house together uh, at the time, and uh, he was working as a roofer, and he came home from uh, from dropping a load off at the Heartland Dump and said, hey, I wrote this song, and he showed it me showed it to me on a napkin. He sat down and played it, and uh, and I thought, I can't believe someone just spent 30 minutes driving home from the Heartland Dump and wrote this beautiful song, and the song is called Heartland. Wow, I know the song, Paul. It's it's one of my favorite ones that, that you do, and um, you're right, it's a perfect song. Every day on the hill Shooting at blackbirds that drank from the well Heartland love Mary Though true love blood did spill And now she lies buried on Mary Gold Sheriff came looking for Heartland for long. Found Heartland working, though nothing was wrong. Heartland took aim at a bird in the sky. And without further warning, shot the sheriff between the eyes. Marshall came looking with ten men or so Found Heartland working the first place they did go Marshall cried out, you done two folks wrong Heartland replied with his bird rifle song Twelve men dead and a woman as well. Heartland shoots blackbirds that drink from the well. Rifle turned backwards, one more blackbird to kill. Now Heartland's dead, staring on Marigold Hill. 